Part four of an introduction to metaphysics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Introduction to Metaphysics by Henri Bergson, translated by T. E. Holm. Part four. There can be no question of following here the various stages of this movement, but having presented a general view of the method and made a first application of it, it may not be amiss to formulate, as precisely as we can, the principles on which it rests. Most of the following propositions have already received in this essay some degree of proof. We hope to demonstrate them more completely when we come to deal with other problems. 1. There is a reality that is external and yet given immediately to the mind. Common sense is right on this point, as against the idealism and realism of the philosophers. 2. This reality is mobility, not things made, but things in the making, not self-maintaining states, but only changing states exist. Rest is never more than apparent, or rather relative. The consciousness we have of our own self in its continual flux introduces us to the interior of a reality, on the model of which we must represent other realities. All reality, therefore, is tendency, if we agree to mean by tendency an incipient change of direction. 3. Our mind, which seeks for solid points of support, has for its main function in the ordinary course of life that of representing states and things. It takes, at long intervals, almost instantaneous views of the undivided mobility of the real. It thus obtains sensations and ideas. In this way, it substitutes for the continuous the discontinuous, for motion stability, for tendency in process of change, fixed points marking a direction of change and tendency. This substitution is necessary to common sense, to language, to practical life, and even in a certain degree, which we shall endeavor to determine, to positive science. Our intellect, when it follows its natural bent, proceeds on the one hand by solid perceptions, and on the other by stable conceptions. It starts from the immobile, and only conceives and expresses movement as a function of immobility. It takes up its position in ready-made concepts, and endeavors to catch in them, as in a net, something of the reality which passes. This is certainly not done in order to obtain an internal and metaphysical knowledge of the real, but simply in order to utilize the real, each concept, as also each sensation, being a practical question which our activity puts to reality, and to which reality replies, as must be done in business by a yes or a no. But, in doing that, it lets that which is its very essence escape from the real. 4. The inherent difficulties of metaphysic, the antinomies which it gives rise to, and the contradictions into which it falls, the division into antagonistic schools, and the irreducible opposition between systems, are largely the result of our applying, to the disinterested knowledge of the real, processes which we generally employ for practical ends. They arise from the fact that we place ourselves in the immobile, in order to lie in wait for the moving thing as it passes, instead of replacing ourselves in the moving thing itself, in order to traverse with it the immobile positions. They arise from our professing to reconstruct reality, which is tendency and consequently mobility, with percepts and concepts whose function it is to make it stationary. With stoppages, however numerous they may be, we shall never make mobility, whereas, if mobility is given, we can, by means of diminution, obtain from it by thought as many stoppages as we desire. In other words, it is clear that fixed concepts may be extracted by our thought from mobile reality, but there are no means of reconstructing the mobility of the real with fixed concepts. Dogmatism, however, in so far as it has been a builder of systems, has always attempted this reconstruction. 5. In this it was bound to fail. It is on this impotence, and on this impotence only, that the skeptical, idealist, critical doctrines really dwell. 
In fact, all doctrines that deny to our intelligence the power of attaining the absolute. But because we fail to reconstruct the living reality with stiff and ready-made concepts, it does not follow that we cannot grasp it in some other way. The demonstrations which have been given of the relativity of our knowledge are therefore tainted with an original vice. They imply, like the dogmatism they attack, that all knowledge must necessarily start from concepts with fixed outlines in order to clasp with them the reality which flows. 6. But the truth is that our intelligence can follow the opposite method. It can place itself within the mobile reality and adopt its ceaselessly changing direction. In short, can grasp it by means of that intellectual sympathy which we call intuition. This is extremely difficult. The mind has to do violence to itself, has to reverse the direction of the operation by which it habitually thinks, has perpetually to revise, or rather to recast, all its categories. But in this way it will attain to fluid concepts, capable of following reality in all its sinuosities, and of adopting the very movement of the inward life of things. Only thus will a progressive philosophy be built up, freed from the disputes which arise between the various schools, and able to solve its problems naturally, because it will be released from the artificial expression in terms of which such problems are posited. To philosophize, therefore, is to invert the habitual direction of the work of thought. 7. This inversion has never been practiced in a methodical manner, but a profoundly considered history of human thought would show that we owe to it all that is greatest in the sciences, as well as all that is permanent in metaphysics. The most powerful of the methods of investigation at the disposal of the human mind, the infinitesimal calculus, originated from this very inversion. Modern mathematics is precisely an effort to substitute the being made for the ready made, to follow the generation of magnitudes, to grasp motion no longer from without and in its displayed result, but from within and in its tendency to change. In short, to adopt the mobile continuity of the outlines of things. It is true that it is confined to the outline, being only the science of magnitudes. It is true also that it has only been able to achieve its marvelous applications by the invention of certain symbols, and that if the intuition of which we have just spoken lies at the origin of invention, it is the symbol alone which is concerned in the application. But metaphysics, which aims at no application, can and usually must abstain from converting intuition into symbols. Liberated from the obligation of working for practically useful results, it will indefinitely enlarge the domain of its investigations. What it may lose in comparison with science in utility and exactitude, it will regain in range and extension. Though mathematics is only the science of magnitudes, though mathematical processes are applicable only to quantities, it must not be forgotten that quantity is always quality in a nascent state. It is, we might say, the limiting case of quality. It is natural, then, that metaphysics should adopt the generative idea of our mathematics in order to extend it to all qualities, that is, to reality in general. It will not, by doing this, in any way be moving towards universal mathematics, that chimera of modern philosophy. On the contrary, the farther it goes, the more untranslatable into symbols will be the objects it encounters. But it will at least have begun by getting into contact with the continuity and mobility of the real, just where this contact can be most marvelously utilized. It will have contemplated itself in a mirror which reflects an image of itself, much shrunken, no doubt, but for that reason very luminous. It will have seen with greater clearness what the mathematical processes borrow from concrete reality, and it will continue in the direction of concrete reality, and not in that of mathematical processes. Having then discounted beforehand what is too modest, and at the same time too ambitious, in the following formula, we may say that the object of metaphysics is to perform qualitative differentiations and integrations. 8. 
the reason why this object has been lost sight of and why science itself has been mistaken in the origin of the processes it employs is that intuition once attained must find a mode of expression and of application which conforms to the habits of our thought and one which furnishes us in the shape of well-defined concepts with the solid points of support which we so greatly need in that lies the condition of what we call exactitude and precision and also the condition of the unlimited extension of a general method to particular cases now this extension and this work of logical improvement can be continued for centuries whilst the act which creates the method lasts but for a moment that is why we so often take the logical equipment of science for science itself forgetting the metaphysical intuition from which all the rest has sprung from the overlooking of this intuition proceeds all that has been said by philosophers and by men of science themselves about the relativity of scientific knowledge what is relative is the symbolic knowledge by pre-existing concepts which proceeds from the fixed to the moving and not the intuitive knowledge which installs itself in that which is moving and adopts the very life of things this intuition attains the absolute science and metaphysics therefore come together in intuition a truly intuitive philosophy would realize the much desired union of science and metaphysics while it would make of metaphysics a positive science that is a progressive and indefinitely perfectible one it would at the same time lead the positive sciences properly so called to become conscious of their true scope often far greater than they imagine it would put more science into metaphysics and more metaphysics into science it would result in restoring the continuity between the intuitions which the various sciences have obtained here and there in the course of their history and which they have obtained only by strokes of genius nine that there are not two different ways of knowing things fundamentally that the various sciences have their root in metaphysics is what the ancient philosophers generally thought their error did not lie there it consisted in their being always dominated by the belief so natural to the human mind that a variation can only be the expression and development of what is invariable whence it followed that action was an enfeebled contemplation duration a deceptive and shifting image of immobile eternity the soul a fall from the idea the whole of the philosophy which begins with plato and culminates in plotinus is the development of a principle which may be formulated thus there is more in the immutable than in the moving and we pass from the stable to the unstable by a mere diminution now it is the contrary which is true modern science dates from the day when mobility was set up as an independent reality it dates from the day when galileo setting a ball rolling down an inclined plane firmly resolved to study this movement from top to bottom for itself in itself instead of seeking its principle in the concepts of high and low two immobilities by which aristotle believed he could adequately explain the mobility and this is not an isolated fact in the history of science several of the great discoveries of those at least which have transformed the positive sciences or which have created new ones have been so many soundings in the depths of pure duration the more living the reality touched the deeper was the sounding but the lead line sunk into the sea bottom brings up a fluid mass which the sun's heat quickly dries into solid and discontinuous grains of sand and the intuition of duration when it is exposed to the rays of the understanding in like manner quickly turns into fixed distinct and immobile concepts in the living mobility of things the understanding is bent on marking real or virtual stations it notes departures and arrivals for this is all that concerns the thought of man in so far as it is simply human it is more than human to grasp what is happening in the interval but philosophy can only be an effort to transcend the human condition men of science have fixed their attention mainly on the concepts with which they have marked out the pathway of intuition the more they laid stress on these residual products which have turned into symbols the more they attributed a symbolic character to every kind of science and the more they believed in the symbolic character of science 
the more did they indeed make science symbolical. Gradually they have blotted out all difference, in positive science, between the natural and the artificial, between the data of immediate intuition, and the enormous work of analysis which the understanding pursues around intuition. Thus they have prepared the way for a doctrine which affirms the relativity of all our knowledge. But metaphysics has also labored to the same end. How could the masters of modern philosophy, who have been renovators of science as well as of metaphysics, have had no sense of the moving continuity of reality? How could they have abstained from placing themselves in what we call concrete duration? They have done so to a greater extent than they were aware, above all, much more than they said. If we endeavor to link together, by a continuous connection, the intuitions about which systems have become organized, we find, together with other convergent and divergent lines, one very determinate direction of thought and of feeling. What is this latent thought? How shall we express the feeling? To borrow once more the language of the Platonists, we will say, depriving the words of their psychological sense, and giving the name of idea to a certain settling down into easy intelligibility, and that of soul to a certain longing after the restlessness of life, that an invisible current causes modern philosophy to place the soul above the idea. It thus tends, like modern science, and even more so than modern science, to advance in an opposite direction to ancient thought. But this metaphysics, like this science, has enfolded its deeper life in a rich tissue of symbols, forgetting something that, while science needs symbols for its analytical development, the main object of metaphysics is to do away with symbols. Here again, the understanding has pursued its work of fixing, dividing, and reconstructing. It has pursued this, it is true, under a rather different form. Without insisting on a point which we propose to develop elsewhere, it is enough here to say that the understanding, whose function it is to operate on stable elements, may look for stability either in relations or in things. In so far as it works on concepts of relations, it culminates in scientific symbolism. In so far as it works on concepts of things, it culminates in metaphysical symbolism but in both cases the arrangement comes from the understanding. Hence it would fain believe itself independent, rather than recognize at once what it owes to an intuition of the depths of reality, it prefers exposing itself to the danger that its whole work may be looked upon as nothing but an artificial arrangement of symbols, so that if we were to hold on to the letter of what metaphysicians and scientists say, and also to the material aspect of what they do, we might believe that the metaphysicians have dug a deep tunnel beneath reality, that the scientists have thrown an elegant bridge over it, but that the moving stream of things passes between these two artificial constructions without touching them. One of the principal artifices of the Kantian criticism consisted in taking the metaphysician and the scientist literally, forcing both metaphysics and science to the extreme limit of symbolism to which they could go, and to which, moreover, they make their way of their own accord, as soon as the understanding claims an independence full of perils. Having once overlooked the ties that bind science and metaphysics to intellectual intuition, Kant has no difficulty in showing that our science is wholly relative, and our metaphysics entirely artificial. Since he has exaggerated the independence of the understanding in both cases, since he has relieved both metaphysics and science of the intellectual intuition which served them as inward ballast, science with its relations presents to him no more than a film of form, and metaphysics with its things no more than a film of matter. Is it surprising that the first, then, reveals to him only frames packed within frames, and the second only phantoms chasing phantoms? He has struck such telling blows at our science and our metaphysics, that they have not even yet quite recovered from their bewilderment. Our mind would readily resign itself to seeing in science a knowledge that is wholly relative, and in metaphysics a speculation that is entirely empty. It seems to us, even at this present date, that the Kantian criticism applies to all metaphysics and to all science. In reality, 
it applies more especially to the philosophy of the ancients, as also to the form, itself borrowed from the ancients, in which the moderns have most often left their thought. It is valid against a metaphysic which claims to give us a single and completed system of things, against a science professing to be a single system of relations. In short, against a science and a metaphysic presenting themselves with the architectural simplicity of the platonic theory of ideas or of a greek temple if metaphysics claims to be made up of concepts which were ours before its advent if it consists in an ingenious arrangement of pre-existing ideas which we utilize as building material for an edifice if in short it is anything else but the constant expansion of our mind the ever-renewed effort to transcend our actual ideas and perhaps also our elementary logic, it is but too evident that, like all the works of pure understanding, it becomes artificial. And if science is wholly and entirely a work of analysis or of conceptual representation, if experience is only to serve therein as a verification for clear ideas, if, instead of starting from multiple and diverse intuition, which insert themselves in the particular movement of each reality, but do not always dovetail into each other, it professes to be a vast mathematic, a single and closed-in system of relations, imprisoning the whole of reality in a network prepared in advance. It becomes a knowledge purely relative to human understanding. If we look carefully into the critique of pure reason, we see that science for Kant did indeed mean this kind of universal mathematic, and metaphysics this practically unaltered platonism in truth the dream of a universal mathematic is itself but a survival of platonism universal mathematic is what the world of ideas becomes when we suppose that the idea consists in a relation or in a law and no longer in a thing kant took this dream of a few modern philosophers for a reality more than this he believed that all scientific knowledge was only a detached fragment of, or rather a stepping stone to, universal mathematics. Hence the main task of the critique was to lay the foundation of this mathematic, that is, to determine what the intellect must be, and what the object, in order that an uninterrupted mathematic may bind them together. And of necessity, if all possible experience can be made to enter thus into the rigid and already formed framework of our understanding, it is, unless we assume a pre-established harmony, because our understanding itself organizes nature, and finds itself again therein as in a mirror. Hence the possibility of science, which owes all its efficacy to its relativity, and the impossibility of metaphysics, since the latter finds nothing more to do than to parody with phantoms of things the work of conceptual arrangement which science practices seriously on relations. Briefly, the whole critique of pure reason ends in establishing that Platonism, illegitimate if ideas are things, becomes legitimate if ideas are relations, and that the ready-made idea, once brought down in this way from heaven to earth, is in fact, as Plato held, the common basis alike of thought and of nature. But the whole of the critique of pure reason also rests on this postulate, that our intellect is incapable of anything but platonizing, that is, of pouring all possible experience into pre-existing moulds. On this the whole question depends. If scientific knowledge is indeed what Kant supposed, then there is one simple science, pre-formed and even pre-formulated in nature, as Aristotle believed. Great discoveries, then, serve only to illuminate, point by point, the already drawn line of this logic, imminent in things, just as on the night of a fate we light up one by one the rows of gas-jets, which already outline the shape of some building. And if metaphysical knowledge is really what Kant supposed, it is reduced to a choice between two attitudes of the mind before all the great problems, both equally possible. Its manifestations are so many arbitrary and always ephemeral choices between two solutions, virtually formulated from all eternity. It lives and dies by antinomies. But the truth is that modern science does not present this unilinear simplicity, nor does modern metaphysics present these irreducible oppositions. Modern science is neither one nor simple. 
it rests, I freely admit, on ideas which in the end we find clear. But these ideas have gradually become clear through the use made of them. They owe most of their clearness to the light which the facts, and the applications to which they led, have by reflection shed on them, the clearness of a concept being scarcely anything more at bottom than the certainty, at last obtained, of manipulating the concept profitably. At its origin, more than one of these concepts must have appeared obscure, not easily reconcilable with the concepts already admitted into science, and indeed very near the borderline of absurdity. This means that science does not proceed by an orderly dovetailing together of concepts predestined to fit each other exactly. True and fruitful ideas are so many close contacts with currents of reality which do not necessarily converge on the same point. However, the concepts in which they lodge themselves manage somehow, by rubbing off each other's corners, to settle down well enough together. On the other hand, modern metaphysics is not made up of solutions so radical that they can culminate in irreducible oppositions. It would be so, no doubt, if there were no means of accepting at the same time and on the same level the thesis and the antithesis of the antinomies. But philosophy consists precisely in this, that by an effort of intuition one places oneself within that concrete reality of which the critique takes from without the two opposed views, thesis and antithesis. I could never imagine how black and white interpenetrate if I had never seen gray. But once I have seen gray, I easily understand how it can be considered from two points of view, that of white and that of black. Doctrines which have a certain basis of intuition escape the Kantian criticism exactly in so far as they are intuitive and these doctrines are the whole of metaphysics, provided we ignore the metaphysics which is fixed and dead in theses, and consider only that which is living in philosophers. The divergencies between the schools, that is, broadly speaking, between the groups of disciples formed round a few great masters, are certainly striking. But would we find them as marked between the masters themselves? Something here dominates the diversity of systems, something, we repeat, which is simple and definite like a sounding, about which one feels that it has touched at greater or less depth the bottom of the same ocean, though each time it brings up to the surface very different materials. It is on these materials that the disciples usually work. In this lies the function of analysis. And the master, in so far as he formulates, develops, and translates into abstract ideas what he brings, is already in a way his own disciple. But the simple act which started the analysis, and which conceals itself behind the analysis, proceeds from a faculty quite different from the analytical. This is, by its very definition, intuition. In conclusion, we may remark that there is nothing mysterious in this faculty. Every one of us has had occasion to exercise it to a certain extent, any one of us, for instance, who has attempted literary composition, knows that when the subject has been studied at length, the materials all collected, and the notes all made, something more is needed in order to set about the work of composition itself, and that is an often very painful effort to place ourselves directly at the heart of the subject, and to seek as deeply as possible an impulse, after which we need only to let ourselves go. This impulse, once received, starts the mind on a path where it rediscovers all the information it had collected, and a thousand other details besides. It develops and analyzes itself into terms which could be enumerated indefinitely. The farther we go, the more terms we discover. We shall never say all that could be said, and yet if we turn back suddenly upon the impulse that we feel behind us, and try to seize it, it is gone for it was not a thing, but the direction of a movement, and though indefinitely extensible, it is infinitely simple. Metaphysical intuition seems to be something of the same kind. What corresponds here to the documents and notes of literary composition is the sum of observations and experience gathered together by positive science. For we do not obtain an intuition from reality, that is, an intellectual sympathy with the most intimate part of it, 
unless we have won its confidence by a long fellowship with its superficial manifestations. And it is not merely a question of assimilating the most conspicuous facts. So immense a mass of facts must be accumulated and fused together, that in this fusion all the preconceived and premature ideas which observers may unwittingly have put into their observations will be certain to neutralize each other. In this way only can the bare materiality of the known facts be exposed to view. Even in the simple and privileged case which we have used as an example, even for the direct contact of the self with the self, the final effort of distinct intuition would be impossible to any one who had not combined and compared with each other a very large number of psychological analyses. The masters of modern philosophy were men who had assimilated all the scientific knowledge of their time, and the partial eclipse of metaphysics for the last half century has evidently no other cause than the extraordinary difficulty which the philosopher finds today in getting into touch with positive science, which has become far too specialized. But metaphysical intuition, although it can be obtained only through material knowledge, is quite other than the mere summary or synthesis of that knowledge. It is distinct from these, we repeat, as the motor impulse is distinct from the path traversed by the moving body, as the tension of the spring is distinct from the visible movements of the pendulum. In this sense metaphysics has nothing in common with a generalization of facts, and nevertheless it might be defined as an integral experience. End of Part 4 Recording by Tricia G. End of An Introduction to Metaphysics by Henri Bergson, translated by T. E. Holm.